Welcome to For the Future. Please keep your microphones muted and your video off so that you can hear and see all of our wonderful panelists. I'm going to suggest that you take your view and you put your view in the gallery view so that you can see everyone. Uh, especially if you are needing an ASL interpreter, just find Olivia's video. And if you hover in the upper right hand corner of her video, you will see three dots and that will let you pin her video to your screen at all times. Questions and comments should be posted in the chat window, and we'll do our best to get to those, especially after our premiere in the talkback portion. As a reminder, this is a family event, and there are young people both attending and participating in the premiere performance. Thank you so much. And now, here's Larry and Dawn. Hello, everyone. Uh, I know Terry just said that everybody should have their videos off, but I think it might be really fun as we're starting, if everybody just puts their video on so we can see everybody's faces and we can all wave and uh, oh, now I, mine's there. I turned mine off asking you to turn it on. So that's nice. It's nice to see everybody. everybody. Thanks for being here. So uh, by the time that uh, Don and I finish our introduction, we would like you to uh, stop video, to turn your video off on the bottom corner the way you just turned it on, okay? So uh, we are here at the 1872 Cafe in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood. And that's where we had originally planned for the event to take place before COVID. Uh, I'm Larry Francer with the Landmark Society of Western New York. And I'm Don Noto from the Susan B. Anthony Neighborhood Association. And we'd like to welcome you to For the Future, Music, Art, and Action. This event was made possible through a Humanities New York Action Grant and additional support from Rochester Institute Technology Performing Arts. So Don and I are very excited to be part of such a momentous event celebrating voting, women's rights, and local history. We'll soon hear from Mina Essery about her piece commissioned by Five by Five and performed by them and the students from Rock Music Collaborative. It is dedicated in the memory of Lisa Hoffman, a former Susan B. Anthony neighborhood resident and daughter of longtime residents Dan and Barbara Hoffman. After hearing from Mina today, you will see the video created by Mark Webster of the world premiere of her piece, Right to a Voice. It was written in the honor of the bicentennial of Susan B. Anthony's birth and the centennial anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. While you enjoy the video, we're asking that you place comments in the chat that follow the acronym VOTE, voicing our thoughts and emotions. Let us know how the music is affecting you in a word or phrase, and Dawn and I will write them down for you. Some examples are like you see on your screen, I vote for equality or I vote for LGBTQ rights. Larry and I will post them at the replica ballot box outside the cafe where Susan B. Anthony placed her vote in 1872. And then after the video, there'll be an inspiring discussion about the suffrage movement. And we encourage you to continue voicing your thoughts and emotions in the chat. More on that after the video. And we will end the event giving everyone a little while to join us here at the 1872 Cafe for a socially distanced short walking tour of our historic neighborhood. And we will end the tour at the Susan B. Anthony Museum and Park. We'll go through the neighborhood and come back to the cafe. So use the chat, make sure you are muted. At this point, we probably would like you to also uh, stop your video. So please click that because we're getting ready. And I do want to say that as well as Olivia being an ASL interpreter for us, you can also get closed caption. So on the bottom, there's closed caption. And when you click on it, you put, what do you put? Don, do you remember what you click? Let me see when I look at it. Uh, you clicked show, uh, subtitle? show subtitle. Good. So without any longer wait, Here's Mina. Thank you, Larry and Dawn, and welcome everyone. It is so nice to just feel the energy in this group, even though we're all coming together from different places. 
I'd like to, first of all, start by thanking all of the organizations who've generously supported this project. It's really been an honor and a joy to be part of such an important event. Uh, I'd also like to give a special thank you to the performers of 5x5 Five Five and also the Rock Music students and Armand for organizing the students. Um, everyone in the recording and uh, the performance that you'll hear really did a, such a wonderful job. And I just appreciate all of the time and energy that everyone put into bringing this to life. So a little bit about the piece. The piece is called Right to a Voice. And it begins with a text quote um, from, from a, uh, a jump rope rhyme that references Susan B. Anthony that says, vote says the lady with the alligator purse. So this was a reference to Susan B. Anthony at her alligator purse that she would carry with her. And which you can actually see if you go to the Susan B. Anthony house and the museum there. So it starts with that. And throughout the piece, you'll hear different text uh, excerpts uh, quotes from Susan B. Anthony. And you'll also hear quotes that were actually written and submitted by the rock music students. So them sharing their thoughts about voting and ideas and words that they wanted to be a part of this piece. So you'll hear those scattered throughout. And actually, I encourage you all to stay on the Zoom call. We'll have a, a YouTube link for those of you who ha are having technical difficulties, but if you can stay on the Zoom call during the piece, that would be wonderful because during the second section, there's actually going to be a live element where some of the students from rock music will be uh, sharing some of those quotes live during the piece as well. So that will be really special. Uh, the piece is also dedicated to the memory of Lisa Hoffman, uh, which Larry and Dawn mentioned earlier. Lisa was a really remarkable member of the Rochester community and uh, the piece is dedicated to her memory. In the second section of the piece, you'll hear that there are some music which, which kind of evokes a sort of fiddling, which is a, an homage to her. She was a violinist um, and you'll also see some, some pictures of her included in the video as well. Some of the musical inspiration of the piece is also tie in with the ideas surrounding Susan B. Anthony's um, work, and especially considering voting and agency and the importance of independence and having that ability to, to vote and make that difference in a community. So in the score, the piece is semi-improvised, -impro semi-improvisatory. So there are certain elements that are written down by me, the composer, but then there are other elements that are up to the performers to decide. And they can make these decisions by listening to each other and then uh, playing uh, certain things at certain times or in certain registers. And then they can, by listening, and um, you know, everyone did a fantastic job recording this, they were listening to each other as they were playing. So they were actually responding to each other as they were going through this recording process. Um, and so in that process, they're actually responding to other musicians, which kind of echoes this idea that when people are given agency, when they're given the ability to vote and to make change in the community, that has an impact, that has a wider impact on everyone, which I think relates back to the work of Susan B. Anthony, which we're celebrating and considering today. So. That's all I'm gonna say about the piece. I hope you enjoy. If you have questions about it, I'd be happy to answer those in the chat. So feel free to send me a chat if you'd like to, to learn a little bit more, um, I'll be here. And I'd also like to uh, last but certainly not least, thank Mark Webster for doing a fantastic, just wonderful, wonderful job on the video and pulling together all sorts of historic photographs that you'll see and um, and all of the all of the video. So, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And I'll give it back to Larry. Thanks, Mina. Uh, we're just about ready to go into the video. We are so excited to enjoy it with all of you. But just remember to vote in the chat during the video. Remember, vote means voicing our thoughts and emotions. And I vote for LGBTQ rights. I vote for equality, or I, I'll probably just write down, I want peace. 
or I want a peaceful transition. Or you can put anything else in the chat or comments as well. And we'll try to capture them as the video is played. Uh, just to let everyone know, if you are having a problem on Zoom, at this point, uh, we have posted a YouTube link in the chat. So you can switch over to that to watch the premiere of the video. But please come back for the talk back because all that's gonna be in YouTube is that video. So without further ado, here's the right to a voice video.
voting is important because you can take part in a big thing.
That was the premiere of a new work commissioned for this event called A Right to a Vote by composer Mina Essery. I am Laura Lentz, Artistic Director and Flutist for the Quintet 5x5. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. We want to mention that we are welcoming donations for the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood. Proceeds from today's event will go to support preservation services for homeowners in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood. You can donate at 5x5music.com. I'm pleased to welcome four distinguished panelists who have joined us today for the next portion of this program. Deborah Hughes, President and CEO of the Susan B. Anthony Museum and House. Kane Marshall, Assistant Professor in Religious Studies and African and African American Studies at the University of Rochester. Jean Pedersen, Associate Professor of History at the Eastman School of Music and the University of Rochester. Catherine Morano Santos, Senior Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Welcome to the four of you. Thanks for being here today. During this portion of the program, everyone is invited to share comments or questions for the panelists in the chat box. And we'll make sure to get to them as, as soon as we can, including them in this conversation. So to start things off, I'm wondering what reactions people had to the video and the new work, A Right to a Voice. Well, I'll say I really loved it. Um, I loved the music. Thank you, Mina. Um, I loved the words. Um, and uh, as a resident of the South Wedge, I heartily support a pedestrian bridge over 490. That was thanks to Lisa Hoffman. Ah, thank you, Lisa Hoffman. And I also loved it. I wrote down a few notes. I was feeling during the piece that all of the different instruments and the different tonalities of those instruments, you could really hear how each one was being featured individually and kind of metaphorically thinking about that. I imagine that being each person's voice. Um, but yet they were all moving forward together, of course, in time and, and drawing on some of the words um, and phrases that were actually spoken as a part of the piece. This idea of all being part of a big thing was, you know, the way that those different instruments were coming together and moving the piece forward. And yet at times they were dissonant. Um, not completely, I think, harmonious. So, you know, we all have our own life experiences. We all have our points of view. We all have um, a unique perspective and yet we're all kind of in this world together moving forward. So I, you know, I was really thinking about it symbolically and really appreciated the messages. Not sure if those were the intended messages, but um, that's kind of what I took away from it. Absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. And there's some wonderful comments being shared in the chat box. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's been involved uh, in making this piece happen. Uh, a lot of, lot of uh, wonderful work. Um, in particular, thank you to Mina for creating such a gorgeous, beautiful work that um, really, I, I completely agree with Catherine. It kind of, this, the collective voices really captures it. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. And I love what Catherine brought up about having those elements of dissonance, which I also think kind of symbolizes the struggle that we have to go through to make change in our communities together. I want to make a shout out to the videographer, too. I really loved seeing each of the individual performers floating onto the screen and the words going across and just the whole thing. I thought it was, it was just really wonderful the way that came out. Thanks, Jean. 
There's a question. I'm wondering where the quotes in the second half came from, particularly bridge over 490 and drumming. That's a great question. So we had a meeting with the rock music students um, quite a few months ago and just asked them, what words do you think should be included in this piece? What words do you want people to hear? And so that's where some of those excerpts came from. The specific references to the bridge over 490 and the audio descriptions at Jiva Theater are paying homage to Lisa Hoffman, who uh, advocated for those uh, improvements, those changes in our own you know, local Rochester community. So I wanted to include those as a tribute to Lisa. Some other comments, Paula says, I love the way this took place right after voting for a female vice president. And yes, and Judy says the children's voices were especially effective. And I completely agree. And I think we heard some live uh, children's voices as well. So thank you to uh, Armand and, and Rock Music Collaborative students for um, adding that and making a uh, live performance also. Uh, as we know, this work was supposed to be performed live uh, today at 1872 Cafe. And um, Armand and I, when we were talking a couple days ago, he made the very good point that this piece is completely appropriate in two to f and four years when we have next election cycles, and we can perform this live uh, when the time is right to, to, to play this all together as it was meant to be uh, performed and shared. Wonderful, fantastic piece and performance. I especially love the effect of what I thought was guitar chords being played backwards. Yes, that's our five by five guitarist, Sung Min Shin. And uh, Sung, yeah, you added a wonderful moment there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing? Yeah, so uh, there's an effect called a reverse delay and it just, it plays back what you play in reverse. And it's quite literally that, and it's kind of a very, uh, unique effect and I thought I, I decided to add that in because I think in this middle part there was a lot of um, moments for I think adding extra effects just to kind of uh, add, add interest to what was happening and uh, that, that's, that was the, cho the choice there with the reverse effect. It shows how sometimes we go backwards in progress. <laughs> yes, it's kind of like moving that. forward but yeah. moving backwards yeah. at the same time. <laughs> And uh, comments from uh, Susan Hoffman. Thank you so much for including Lisa in this wonderful performance. Well, thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you for being here also. Uh, yeah, reverse chords. Sung always steals all of our thunder. <laughs> um, any other comments about, about the piece? Thank you for, for sharing this with us today, everybody. And uh, that uh, YouTube link, if you weren't able to catch it for whatever reason, if you had trouble, um, that's available as well for you uh, to watch it there. Uh, were there any other comments about the piece? I was struck no. by, um, very much struck by the, the metaphor, um, you know, in the ways that we're, we really as a nation are rethinking our whole social contract. You know, that idea that each of us gives up certain freedoms uh, to take on the responsibility of building something as a whole together. And I loved that the way the piece drew in all of the different tonalities and the different voices of the instruments, as well as the children's voices and the adult voices, and at the same time, the audience voices, people saying, these are the things that I hope for. These are the things that I vote for. And I think there isn't a better metaphor than an ensemble who each brings their own voice and sound to create something bigger and more powerful. And I, and I think you, then you added to that this visual layer of the video. And it just, uh, to me, it, it is, it embodies what we want to do together in terms of building community. Beautiful, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go on to the next question. I'm wondering what thoughts everybody has about the election. Mm. Can I say that I'm profoundly relieved <laughs> um, that I slept well this weekend in a way that I haven't slept in so long that I'd forgotten that I wasn't sleeping well. Um, and I know someone in the audience has already said how wonderful it is to be at this event <clears throat> after the election of our first female vice president. I also want to say how wonderful it is to be at this event after the election of our first black and South Asian vice president. This is a multiply wonderful day for 
for many, many reasons. Um, and it's Susan B. Anthony's Rochester and it's Frederick Douglass's Rochester and both of those people are important to me today. Yes, thank you, Jean. Absolutely. Judy says, love the sight of people celebrating and dancing in so many cities. Riley says, I feel a bit relieved, but pray the protests won't stop. Hmm. Yeah. I'm so impressed, Paula says, I'm so impressed with the acceptance speeches and overjoyed for the LBGTQ community. Yes, absolutely. I'll say a little bit about how I'm feeling about the election. Um, I took my son with me, which was pretty cool. And he was adamant that I, I vote for Kamala Harris <laughs> um, on his behalf, maybe. But, you know, even with this 1872 um, commemoration, right, I, I think about the accolades were given Kamala, which are definitely warranted. Um, but I think about 1972 when Shirley Chisholm, right, the first black president or black woman, you know, ran for president here, right? Um, and I think about even our community, what we're going through um, with Daniel Prude and our mayor. And um, I think about these collective communities of women. Um, and adamantly, I think about the women in Georgia um, with Stacey Abrams. Um, really g galvanizing 800,000 people to register to vote in the same spirit of what Susan B. Anthony was fighting for. So that's what I'm thinking thus far. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Mona is saying, I'm interested in hearing about the ways that the suffrage movement has in the past and perhaps now as well reflects winning legal slash legal victories, but also cultural and social changes, things that can be harder to measure. Yeah, and I just wanted to build on a, a couple of the those thoughts, um, you know, and thinking about in processing the current election, I was thinking about how the democratic ideals upon which the United States is theoretically founded is kind of an evolving and ongoing struggle. And, you know, so many groups of people have been disenfranchised and there are erasures and, um, you know, people that have not had a voice, right? And so there are so many ways that things that have happened locally have created and opened up those opportunities for additional people to have voices. And we at the Rochester Museum and Science Center have been working on this exhibition, The Changemakers, <clears throat> which highlights over 20 of those women who have done things locally to both change Rochester, the Rochester region, the state, the nation, and the world. And so reflecting on those stories, I mean, it just shows us how kind of imperfect this <clears throat> idea of democracy is and how it's always this ongoing and evolving struggle. Um, and it's really um, something that everyone has to constantly work towards. And when I think about the examples of these women that are featured in the exhibit, like Maria Lopez, for example, who's someone who um, was born in Puerto Rico, uh, did not learn to read or or write or speak English until she came to the United States as a young woman, wanted to vote and was not able to do so. It was actually her court case that extended the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to enable people whose first language was not English to also have the right to vote. And so the work that she um, did is something that, that really changed that. And when I went to the polls and saw the ballots in Spanish, we really have Maria Lopez, a Rochester woman to thank for that. So, um, you know, again, just so many different examples of Rochester women who have been involved in this ongoing struggle. And that struggle is generational. There's concentric levels of that impact. So um, we really owe Rochester women and Haudenosaunee women um, who are the indigenous women of this land you know, for so many different uh, freedoms that we enjoy today and are constantly having to 
um, organize and advocate for on an ongoing basis. So I think for me, the, the current election really highlights the need for us all to participate as these women have and to, to keep telling those stories. Catherine, can you give more information about Changemakers to everybody listening? Yeah, absolutely. So the Changemakers is an exhibition that's opening at the Rochester Museum and Science Center on November 20th. So next Friday is our public opening. And it was a community curated process. So we had a multitude of voices and perspectives of different people um, throughout the community and representing different organizations in the community who participated in the process. We also had three diversity and inclusion consultants who were part of that process. Um, and the result is this 7,000 square foot exhibition highlighting the stories of 200 women, many of them lesser known examples um, of stories of women who, as I said before, have changed both the Rochester region and the world through their work. So by telling these stories of the life and work of these women, um, we really hope to dispel some of the myths that women haven't had really important contributions and impacts throughout time. It's featuring both historic women as well as contemporary women. It's about a half and half split. And so just really emphasizing that, you know, from the beginning of time up through the present day, women are leading a lot of these rights to advocate for change, to organize for change, to invent change in many different forms and to enterprise change through things like social entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, we, we've really tried to ensure that everyone who may visit the exhibit in person or see it online and engage with it virtually will be able to see themselves in these change makers and, and that it'll really underscore that we all can be change makers in our own lives. Wonderful. Wonderful. I would like to ask another question. Since we're marking the Susan B. Anthony Bicentennial and 19th Amendment Centennial at the 1872 Cafe, is there anything you learn from history that gives you perspective? I'm struck by, uh, there were so many different things going on in the movement because one of the first pieces was just to get respect for women um, and for people of color throughout our time to say these are human beings who should be a part who have a right to be at the table. And often we know that the vote is the ultimate tool uh, because anyone else can make laws that can oppress and uh, we have to vote the right people in. But there's also the same kind of work that's so important, which is the local work that changes people's hearts and minds. You know, the work that we're doing here with, with Rochester's race equity challenge, um, the, the response that we have as a community to Daniel Prude, to uh, the challenges that we have to meet. Sometimes it's not just about the vote because the vote can become the divisive piece. It can be, it's, it gets manipulated by different teams who want their side to win, uh, not necessarily for the good of all. But the real work also becomes that work of changing hearts and minds and opening hearts and minds. And I, I think that that's really significant. That, that was one thing that the suffrage movement understood, that while they were campaigning and working to push through a federal amendment, it was all of the local groups back home that were changing and opening the idea, the doors, for the possibility that women might vote. And as we look at that history, it, it's complicated and it's not all idealistic either. Uh, and if we really want social change, I think that's one of the learnings for me about the suffrage movement. Uh, we have to really both be willing to challenge ourselves to say, are we living up to those ideals that we're speaking about? And then we have to be willing to figure out how to change hearts. I was, um, I was thinking a lot about history while I was watching the video and, and um, you know, you're right, Deborah, parts of the suffrage movement were really messy. Um, and it could be inclusive and it could be exclusive. And the historical images in the video are very white. Um, but there were Black women in the 19th century and the 20th century who fought for equality. I think of Ida B. Wells um, or Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Um, 
I would like to hope that people taking photos of the women's movement today, our images will not be so white, that we are a more multicultural and more inclusive movement now than maybe we always were 100 or 150 years ago. I really hope for that. Thank you for that, Jean. I, I was gonna comment on that aspect as well. And I think it might capture more than we want to about the human experience. Um, we laud, right, the 1920s as being this historic moment for women to get to vote, but Black women had to wait up to five decades afterwards in order to earn that opportunity. And even in the suffrage movement, speaking in terms of what history offers and what I think about, um, Black women were there, right? They were there at the 1913 suffrage march, um, but they were there in a different capacity. They were not allowed to walk in front. They had to be in the back. They were spat on. Um, so when we think about moving forward in the future, um, I th think we all have those kind of complex humanness, right? We're, I can speak only for myself and thinking I'm this liberal person um, when in fact there are people who are not I, I may not be fighting for those who are um, differently able perhaps I hadn't considered their perspective um, women who aren't able to birth children um, trans sisters uh, so maybe we look at our own pictures that we're taking now as Jean indicates and say you know who's Who's missing? What's what's the full picture? We're voting, right? We're doing these things in certain districts, and yet the University of Rochester is one of the most segregated um, places in terms of faculty. It doesn't have as many um, people of color as reflected per the community, right? Um, so just thinking about those pictures and moving forward, that we can learn from history, that as we know, we were there, um, but we weren't captured. So thank you for that, Jean. There's a couple of comments in the chat box. Paula says, Deborah's comments should remind us that white women won the, the right to vote 45 years before women of color did. That breaks my heart. Uh, Riley says racism won in the feminist movement. I do believe that some leaders sold out the amazing black leaders from racism and from self-serving power politics. Connie Marshall preached beautifully held. And Armin says, I have been completely struck by the Canadian description of society as a mosaic instead of our melting pot. In a mosaic, we are individuals that make the whole. We do not lose ourselves. Yeah, I, I had not heard that mosaic image before, but I like that a lot. I think what I've usually heard is salad bowl, a melting pot or a salad bowl. Um, but a mosaic is more beautiful. Uh, perhaps I'm saying too much about my attitude towards green vegetables, but I feel that a mosaic is more beautiful to me than a salad bowl. <laughs> um, um, but, um, you know, it's complicated in the school in this country because we have a federal system and we have a state system. So black women did get the right to vote in 1920 with every other citizen woman in the United States, indigenous women really had to wait longer. But because voting was organized state by state, what that meant was that black women in the North got to vote. And black women in Chicago, for example, where I used to live, black women in Chicago, where Ida B. Wells was from, they became a voting powerhouse that candidates really had to reckon with. But it's black women in the South that had to wait for the civil rights movement. Um, not to say that the North is a perfect set of anti-racist states, because that certainly is not the case in any way whatsoever. Um, but some Black women did get to vote in 1920, depending on where they were living. And they took that vote, and they ran with it and did great things with it. Well, and I think also Constance Mitchell, for example, is one of our featured change makers in the exhibition. And you know, she was inviting people into her home to help with 
um, studying and education around the literacy test requirements and, and also did things with the driver's license requirements. So, you know, there are people in Rochester who are also advocating and organizing to um, make it possible for people who were being disenfranchised from the vote to be able to vote. So that's another important part about telling the truth about history, which has, you know, shaped our, our current circumstances. Um, we need to highlight all of the things that have created an inequitable um, position for people today, but then also celebrate the things that people have done throughout history to transform that circumstance so that we can inspire this generation and the future. I think that's a perfect way to wrap up thinking about the future and what we can do. We are close to three o'clock. We are going to be um, ha uh, meeting up down at 1872 Cafe for a neighborhood walk with Larry and Dawn. And I think I'd like at this point, first of all, to thank the panelists for joining us today in this uh, wonderful conversation together. And um, thank you to all of you for participating in the conversation. Uh, and Terry has included, we are accepting donations again at the at our website, 5 by 5 musiccom uh, Feel free to uh, please donate and support uh, preservation efforts in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood. And um, I think with that, uh, unless there's anything else to add, but I think I'd like to uh, pass things on to Larry and Don. but thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everybody for this wonderful conversation. And I'll pass it on to Larry and Don down at 1872 Cafe. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, this has just been a wonderful event for everybody involved. And we really wanna thank our panelists for joining this event. Uh, Jean Elizabeth Peterson from the Eastman School of Music and the University of Rochester. Deborah Hughes from the Susan B. Anthony House and Museum. Kane Marshall from the University of Rochester. Catherine Murano Santas from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And Laura Lentz, thank you so much for moderating and everything you did putting this whole program together for us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we also, of course, want to thank once again, Mina Essery for her amazing composition, uh, Mark Webster for the wonderful video and Terry Bacon and Dean Southard for technical assistance. Thanks to all of them. Thank you. Yes. And Armin Hall, executive director of rock music and his students, oh my gosh, Great job, students. Sergio Novato, Zayamar Rosario, Ruthana Trincini, Nadia Jones, and Abrahat Doris Eaton. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we absolutely have to thank Five by Five mm -hmm. for their wonderful performance. Laura Lentz, Marcy Bacon, Sungmin Shin, Heian Jun, and Eric Polinick. And thank everybody for joining us today. Larry and I will be here at the 1872 Cafe. It's located at 431 West Main Street. And we'll be leading the historic walking tour in about 30 minutes. You'll see us right out front. Right. Hope to see everybody. And thanks again to everyone involved in making this afternoon such a success. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. <laughs>